Let's sing this song together. Yes, I will. I count one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Welcome to worship here at the First United Methodist Church of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. It's June, it is Sunday morning, and we're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of our worshiping congregation this morning. Wherever you are, if you're in Broken Arrow or anywhere around the state or around the country, if you're in your living room, if you're at the kitchen table, if you're on the back porch, if you're in a boat, wherever you might be, we're glad that you are taking this time to worship with us. Uh, worship is a vital part of who we are uh, as followers of Jesus, and we're glad that you're part of our congregation this morning. We like to begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we come into your presence, and Lord, we thank you for the technology that allows us to be together even when we are apart. We thank you that no matter what's happening in our world, you are a God of love and justice and mercy and compassion. You're our creator, you're our redeemer, you're the lover of our souls. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for blessing us. Lord, we also want to simply lift up our world, our community. Um, there are so many struggles that are a part of our life. Um, we continue, Lord, to ask that as people struggle with this pandemic, 
uh, that you would be with physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals and all the people who are keeping us safe and keeping us fed, um, that you would speed the, the work of those working on, on vac- vaccines and cures, um, that you would be with our nation as we continue to practice uh, safe practices that allow us to stay healthy, and that all who are ill and suffering, that you would give them comfort and healing and strength. Lord, on top of that, our nation has been struggling with um, the cries of those who uh, feel the oppression of racism. And Lord, because of this sin of racism, there has been unrest, there has been violence, um, Lord, there has been danger. And, and Lord, we simply want to lift up this entire situation to you. Lord, we know that we are all one race, the human race, made in your image. We ask that you would bring peace and justice to our nation. Uh, Lord, we pray for peace and we also pray for justice. And that in every situation you would protect people uh, who are in hazardous and dangerous places. Uh, Lord, that you would be there in a spirit of forgiveness and mercy and compassion and brotherhood and sisterhood, uh, that you would help us as a nation continue to make progress towards that day when we all uh, can reach out in brotherhood and sisterhood to one another and lift one another up. Lord, there are many other things that are going on in our lives, in our world. Uh, Lord, we lift them up to you right now in our hearts. And we lift up, Lord, that prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. When he said, pray like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Join us in singing hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And we're going to sing verses 1 and 3. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a tatter, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Use my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for Good morning. Our scripture today is Ephesians 6, 10 through 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on your full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Folks, I want to remind you that our virtual vacation Bible school, we're calling it QBS, a quarantine Bible school, starts a week from tomorrow on the 15th. And we need you to sign your kids or your grandkids up. Uh, the way you sign them up is you just go to the address that's there on the screen. Uh, we want you to sign them up because there's a t-shirt, there's a craft packet, there's materials 
that you'll be able to pick up here at the church before it starts on the 15th. So sign your kids up for this amazing uh, virtual VBS. It'll have singing and dancing and crafts and science experiments and videos with animals and a, a lot of cool stuff featuring a lot of the folks that are our VBS leaders every year. So you want your kids to be involved in this. It'll be uh, online every morning of the 15th through the 19th. So sign those kids up today. And uh, let's pray. Lord, once again, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. Lord, you're our rock and you're our redeemer. Amen. Every year, new words are born, driven by technology or culture or both. Every year, there are new words, and every year, new words are added to the dictionary. The Oxford Dictionary adds about a thousand new words to its dictionary every year. But also every year, the Oxford Dictionary selects one word to be the word of the year. This is the word that had the biggest impact, that uh, was used the most of the new words. And here's some of the words of the year over the last uh, few years. In 2005, it was podcast. In 2009, it was unfriend. 2013, selfie. 2014, vape. And in 2015, it wasn't a word at all. It was that uh, crying while laughing emoji. But in 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. Post-truth. The definition of post-truth is this relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. That's post-truth. Now let's just think about that for, for just a minute. Post-truth. More and more, we are living in a post-truth culture. Now, for years, sociologists have used the word post-Christian to describe our culture. And what that means is our culture has gone to the place where Christianity is no longer dominant, where Christian values and Christian standards are no longer the norm. And so they talk about us living in a post-Christian, a after-Christian culture. But now, apparently, we are also living in a post-truth culture, a culture where the objective truth matters less and less. And, well, what you believe to be the truth depends a lot upon where you get your, your information, your, your facts. Where do you get your news? Where do you get your truth? From Fox News? From CNN? From MSNBC? From, from Facebook? From Twitter? From Instagram? Maybe it's from the Weekly World News. This has been around for a while. You get the most interesting headlines on the weekly world news, like President Obama appointing a Martian ambassador, or the discovery that Dick Cheney is a robot. So, so where do you get your news, and how do we know what is true? Well, I'm starting a new sermon series this morning on the full armor of God. Now, as we read earlier, Paul uses this illustration of the full armor of God to talk about how we, as followers of Jesus, how we have to be equipped to face the challenges of living a Christian life. And it's really easy to see why Paul decided to use this particular illustration. Remember, when he wrote this book of Ephesians, he was in jail. He was under guard. He was with a Roman soldier 24-7. Uh, he had a Roman soldier right there in the room with him. And knowing Paul, he undoubtedly spent time talking to that guard, telling that guard about Jesus. But he studied that guard's uniform, that guard's armor. And as he watched that Roman soldier day in and day out, he came up with this image, this illustration of the full armor of God. And the first piece of the armor, he mentioned six pieces of armor, and we're just going to talk about the first one today. The first piece of the armor he mentions is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. 
Now, in those days in the first century, most everyone, men and women, wore loose-fitting robes. But that doesn't work very well for fighting. You can't fight, really, when you're wearing a, a loose robe. So a Roman soldier would, the first thing he did would be take a belt and wrap it around his waist to cinch up all that loose fabric. Also, the belt provided a place for him to keep his sword. And so the first piece of armor, the first part of the uniform, is a belt. And Paul talks about the belt of truth. Because the first thing we need to navigate as followers of Jesus is truth. And, you know, sometimes getting at the truth is harder than you think. Because we want the truth, we want facts. We might say we want the unvarnished truth. But where does it come from? Where do we get our facts? Where do we get our truth? Increasingly, it seems, in our culture, because there's so many choices and there's so many outlets of information, people only want to get their truth from people who already agree with them. People tend to turn to those sources of people who are already in full agreement with their opinions. Now, news people know this, politicians know this, Almost every study shows that almost every politician either lies or bends the truth to the point of breaking. And some politicians just lie all the time. Some of them seem to have forgotten how to tell the truth. And that's a problem. It's not a new problem because politicians, anyone in power, people in power, tend to want to control information. And we see this in the Bible. When Jesus is brought before a government official, when Jesus is brought before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, um, there's an interesting interchange. Because Pilate knew that the Jewish leaders were not being truthful. And we know it too. We know what had happened the night before. Jesus had been brought in to the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. He'd been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'd been taken to this impromptu emergency meeting of the Jewish council. And through false witnesses and intimidation, Jesus is found guilty of blasphemy for claiming to be the Messiah, for claiming to be the Son of God. He's found guilty of blasphemy. But the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin knew that if they brought Jesus to the Roman governor and said, this man is guilty of blasphemy, they, they, he'd laugh in their faces. Blasphemy was not a crime in the Roman Empire. And so, even though he was found guilty of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin, when they brought him to the Roman official, to the governor, they said the crime was sedition. They claimed that Jesus was a dangerous revolutionary, that, that he intended to try to raise up a rebellion, a revolt, to overthrow the Roman government, that he called himself the king of the Jews, and that was a threat to Caesar. It was all, of course, a blatant lie. But they brought Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate could smell that there was something untruthful in these charges. Jesus didn't look like a dangerous revolutionary. So Pilate calls Jesus inside his headquarters and begins to question him himself. And Pilate says to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Are you a king? And here's how Jesus replies. It's John 18, 37. It says, Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. You hear what Jesus says there? Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Now, Pilate, the governor, Pilate, the politician, his answer to that is classic because Pilate responds, what is truth? What is truth? He understood the politics of the day. He understood that in the Roman Empire, truth was whatever the emperor said was truth. If the emperor said the sky is purple, then the truth is the sky is purple. If the emperor said he was descended from the gods, then that was the truth. Because whatever the emperor said was true for the empire, that was truth. So Pilate cynically said, what is truth? As if to say, 
truth is not objective. Truth is just whatever the people in power says that it is. He'd grown cynical with the idea that there could ever be something that we know to be objectively true. But we know that there is such a thing as objective truth with a capital T. So how can we know the truth? Well, it depends on the topic. You want to know the truth about washing machines or the rings of Saturn or Barcelona in Spain or COVID-19 or all kinds of topics. There are reliable sources of information about science and geography and mathematics and mechanics. There's lots of places where you can find objective information, objective truth about all kinds of things. But what about, what about the big questions? What about the big questions about right and wrong, morality, justice, how to treat people, the the meaning of life, human relationships, what does it mean to have a life of, of meaning and purpose, ethical questions, God questions, which path is the right path in life? Well, for those questions, for those big questions, we look to the Bible. But even when we look to the Bible, we have to be careful. Even when we search the Scriptures, we have to be careful. Now, we know the Bible is the Word of God. It is the witness to the perfect Word of God, Jesus Christ. It is the book that reveals to us God's plan for our world. The Bible is full of 66 books where God inspired human authors to proclaim God's love and God's power and God's plan. The Bible is God's book, and it's the most, the most read book in the history of the world. It's also the most misused book in the history of the world, because people have misused the Bible to justify horrible things. People have misused the Bible to justify slavery and bigotry and revenge, even genocide. And so, when we turn to the Bible we have to have some wisdom and some guidelines. And the first thing we have to understand when we search the Scriptures for the truth is we have to understand the context. We have to understand when these words were spoken, to whom, under what circumstance, and and the Scriptures that surround a particular verse. Because it's so easy to just pull a verse of Scripture out of context, just out of the blue, and use it to justify and back up what you already think. It's so easy to pull a verse out of context and try to make it say what you want it to say instead of allowing that Scripture to shape our opinions and to shape us. And so, we always have to understand the context of a Bible passage or a Bible verse. And if something doesn't seem to make sense or this passage doesn't seem to be in harmony with another passage, we know that the teachings of Jesus, the words of Jesus, are always the lens that we use to interpret all of Scripture. So the Bible is where we, as followers of Jesus, the Bible is where we begin our search for truth with a, with a capital T. But in the United Methodist Church, we look also to the example of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. And Wesley used three other tools in his search for understanding and truth, reason, tradition, and experience. Reason, tradition, and experience help us. We start with the Bible. We always start with the Bible, but we also use reason and tradition and experience. Now, tradition and experience are simply a way of saying, in the 21st century, we're not the first people to ask these questions. In the 21st century, we're not the first generation to struggle with questions about life and right and wrong. I mean, we have a well of wisdom, uh, of previous generations of Christians, and we need to continually look to that, look to that depth of that well, all all that wisdom of previous generations, those traditions and those experiences. But let's think about this word reason for a minute. God gave us these amazing things called brains. He, He gave us this amazing ability to think and reason and learn, and the Bible lifts up the value of learning. The Bible lifts up the value of wisdom. All through the book of Proverbs, wisdom 
is praise. Proverbs 13, 13 says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Now, wisdom in the Bible is more than just mere facts. Wisdom is more than just knowing a lot of facts. There's a lot of people who know a lot of facts who are still not very good people. It's understanding the bigger picture. You know, in the New Testament, the Pharisees, these people who are continually criticizing Jesus, coming into conflict with Jesus, the Pharisees were very proud of the fact that they had memorized all 616 commands of Moses, all of the 616 laws of Moses. They were proud of their biblical knowledge. But here's what Jesus says about them in a long passage in Matthew 23, where He is really kind of ripping them apart. Matthew 23, 23 says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now, what's he talking about there? The Pharisees had memorized the laws. One of those laws was about tithing, giving 10% of your resources, your income, back to the Lord. And so most people tithe their crops, they tithe their, their livestock, or whatever else they made their living at. But the Pharisees wanted to make sure they were perfectly obedient to this law. So they not only tithed their crops or their livestock or whatever other money they had, they tithed their spices. They'd have a, a little bit of dill weed or cumin, and they would measure it out and scrape out 10% of the spice and bring that to the temple. Now, Jesus says there's nothing wrong with that, but He says, you you focus so much on the minutia, you've ignored the big picture. He says, you, you focus on these petty little things, and you've ignored justice and mercy and faithfulness. You, you've missed the forest for staring at the trees. Truth, truth leads to justice. Truth leads to mercy. Truth leads to faithfulness. Most of you, if you've been around this church in the years that I've been here, and by the way, I uh, am now that it's June, uh, I have finished 17 years here as the pastor here. I'm starting year 18. Thank you to the bishop for appointing me for another year. Most of you know that uh, if you've been around that I am a big superhero fan, especially I'm a big Batman fan. But I also grew up watching reruns of the old Superman TV show from the 1950s. Now, uh, this show uh, featured George Reeves as a Superman. He was not nearly as pumped up as modern uh, movie superheroes. The special effects on this show were practically non-existent and very cheesy. But I, I loved watching it. And the thing I remember the most is that every episode opened with an announcer giving us a brief synopsis of who this Superman fellow was. He was a strange visitor from another planet who was faster than a speeding bullet. But this little announcement, this little introduction at the beginning, always ended with these words. It said, Superman who fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. A never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Now, when I was a little kid, and I would hear that at the beginning of every episode, that was my first glimpse as to what it meant to be an American. What do Americans believe in? What is the American way? Well, I understood that the American way was truth and justice. American values, at least according to Superman, American values were truth and justice. Truth and justice are not only American values, they are Christian values. As Christians, we value truth and justice. And we too are in a never-ending battle against the forces of, of evil, some of which we can see and some of which we can't. But we use the weapons of truth and justice, weapons against racism, Weapons against ignorance, weapons against cruelty, 
Weapons against prejudice. Yes, we love peace as followers of Jesus. We are people of the kingdom of peace. But we are always in a struggle against the forces of darkness, against the forces of evil. And the weapons that we have, Paul talks about this armor that we wear as we go into battle against dark forces. And the first component of that armor, the first essential piece of that armor is truth. And so, we buckle on the belt of truth. And over the weeks ahead, we'll look at all the other pieces of that armor that Paul talks about. But today, remember, Jesus says the truth, well, the truth sets you free. And everyone who's on the side of truth is on the side of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of truth. Lord, we thank You that in the Scriptures we find truth, that when we use the the tools of reason and science, we we find the truth. And Lord, the truth leads us to know that um, we should be continually fighting for what's right, for what's just, for what's fair, for what's loving, for what's kind, for what's compassionate, for what's merciful. Lord, help us to always cling and search and fight for the truth. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of truth as well as a God of love. We praise you and we thank you in your precious name. Amen. Bring your peace to a desperate world, rooted by your stream. Your kingdom is forever, your promise is still true, mercy be. Folks, once again, we've come to the end of our time of worship and so grateful that you've chosen to be with us as part of our worshiping congregation this morning. We now have a time of stewardship. Stewardship continues to be so important. Uh, Our gifts are what allow our church to continue to be the church 
Now, we are the church in a little different way than we have been over the last two and a half months. We're doing things differently. Uh, we're reaching out in different ways. We're trying to be as creative as we can. Things like our virtual VBS that's starting here in, a, in about a week from tomorrow. Um, we still have a lot of expense. Not only do we need to continue to pay our staff, but things like producing uh, a virtual VBS, uh, it costs money and a different kind of money. Uh, things that we are doing, we continue to have expenses, and thankfully, you as a congregation have continued to be faithful in stewardship and gifts. We're so thankful for that. There's lots of ways to continue to practice good stewardship. You can continue to just mail your check into the church, 112 East College Street, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 74012. Uh, you can use uh, the miracle of technology to give. You can go on the internet, you can go to our website, you scroll down, there's a place that says give. Uh, and it's very easy there to enter the information, just like all the other things we do online. You can use your smartphone to give. You simply text an amount to that number that's on the screen. Uh, you can talk to Tammy in our financial office and arrange to have uh, a set amount uh, come out of your checking account every week or every month or every quarter, an automatic draft. You can start that at any time, end it at any time, change it at any time. Lots of different ways for us to continue to practice good stewardship. So thank you for that. I hope that you continue to have a wonderful week. Go now in the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.